Let's talk money, cash, bread, moolah. It's the root of all evil, but it makes the world go round. It can't buy happiness, but it can buy me thousands of chicken nuggets from Burger King. Money is everywhere in video games, and it can serve a huge purpose. In most games, racking up money certainly helps in giving the player a measurement of progression. Some games use money as just a collectible to rack up your score or earn a power-up. And some games just use money as an artificial method for pacing, placing payment barriers that require you to stop and get your funds up so that you can proceed through the game. But regardless, in-game currency systems have clearly become commonplace in the games we play. But what people don't realize is how much gameplay and in-game economies are intertwined. Like, let me ask you this. How many times have you breezed your way through a Pokemon game? You beat the shit out of trainers and stuff all their cash under your Snorlax's armpits like my shady Uncle Giuseppe. Then, when you make it to the Elite Four, you just absolutely ball out at the shop. You're buying hundreds of Forest Stores and Revives, a new grill for your Bidoof, a bent baller chain for your Machamp. You then enter the Elite Four and sweep everybody with your infinite supply of healing items. It's so easy to exploit. Now that I think about it though, the Pokemon economy in general just makes zero sense. $26,000 worth of sides? What are these sides? They cure cancer? The sides did cure cancer, that's the problem. They were there, that's why they were expensive. I had never thought about how important money and shop prices are in video games until I tried to make my own Minecraft server a couple weeks ago. Uh, stupid, I know. I set up a whole shop with plugins and whatnot. Suddenly, within a day, there were 10 Jordan Belforts running around with full diamond armor and enchanted diamond swords just wreaking havoc. Why did this happen? Well, because I'm an idiot, that's why. I set up an entire shop and gave very little thought to the economy. I carelessly put in the option to sell any item for markups that were way too high, and I was selling diamonds for way too low. So people took full advantage of the shop by farming easy items, selling them back, and then buying stacks of diamonds. My stupid economy made the game way too easy. So I had to give up on my dreams of becoming a Minecraft entrepreneur. And then I realized that I'm way too dumb to mold an economy for real people. I don't know two things about GDP and supply and demand curves and the uh, pie charts. I don't fuck. So in this video, I won't be talking about real money schemes like V-Bucks or mobile game economies like Clash of Clans or even EVE Online's fascinating lifelike economy. Quite frankly, these topics are way out of my league. But I do know enough to realize that in single player games, the currency and what you can do with it can directly impact gameplay in many ways. Making economies that work in video games can be a tall task, and sometimes it can really make or break the game's difficulty and natural order of progression. Going back to Pokemon's bad economy, the widespread availability of free healing at the Pokemon centers provides very little incentive for going to the Pokemart and spending your cashola on consumables. In economics terms, the demand for healing items is so low because there's an infinite free supply of full health at the Pokemon centers, and the travel distances are so short between routes and towns that it's worth it to just run back and forth to the Pokemon centers rather than spend cash on antidotes and whatnot. Because of this, shopping in the game is basically an afterthought to the player unless you want some evolution stones or some new moves. Like I mentioned earlier, that is, until you enter the Elite Four gauntlet where they take the Pokemon Center away, leaving you with only your items to use between battles. So it's no surprise that we all stockpile on revives when we get to this point. But I would argue that this effectively dulls the challenge that comes with fighting the Elite Four. If you really had to, you can beat the champion with severely underleveled Pokemon, just by continuously reviving and switching around until the opponent has no moves left. Tactic that I've admittedly used before because I, I suck at video games, to be honest, everyone. Hence, there's this over-distribution of resources that waters down the impact and consequences of combat. But hey, this is Pokemon after all, they don't really have to care. A good shop system should be useful for the entire duration of the game, not just at the very end when you're practically Bezos level rich and need some cheesy way to ply your way to the end credits. There are many traditional RPGs outside of Pokemon that have more purposeful shops, which have you spending your money evenly throughout your whole playthrough. Take a traditional JRPG like Earthbound or Chrono Trigger, you'll find that the shops have greater purpose as places where the player can purchase upgrades to weapons and armor. Now, as you progress through the story, your older purchases will gradually become less effective against higher level enemies. So there's always this demand for new defense and attack upgrades, meaning that money always has a valid purpose. Inherently, these items will be more expensive as you become stronger, but these games also evenly scale out money distribution for you along the way by giving higher rewards for tougher victories so you can actually afford the upgrades. The result is a shop system that becomes a nice side element in getting stronger, 
you never feel like you have too much money or too little as you play the game. These economies are done well as they nicely coincide with the scale of difficulty, essentially allowing the player's wealth and purchasing ability to rise along with his skill level and the strength of the enemies. It's a lot more rewarding this way and provides a heightened sense of progression when you have expensive and powerful equipables by the time you finish the game. Looking past RPGs, there are some gameplay styles that don't need so much thought put into their economies, namely open world games like Grand Theft Auto. These games are unique because the player has a lot more freedom in terms of how they want to earn and spend their money. GTA's economy is obviously the most grandiose, unsurprisingly. I don't play Grand Theft Auto for the great level design and linear scale of difficulty. I play because it's a wild and ridiculous time, and the economy reflects that. The game tempts you to take on high paying missions by offering a slew of fancy cars and other crazy things to purchase. You make big money by committing big crimes, and what you do with that money is really how you please. Unlike its RPG cousins, GTA sort of caps off in terms of difficulty, so you don't really need to keep spending on items that make you stronger. Once you have your go-to guns and enough ammo, there's still a lot of room for spending like an idiot. I mean, it's not like a million dollar sports car will give you a big advantage during a mission, but fuck it. It's Grand Theft Auto. Go wild. Personally, I love to make it rain at strip clubs and cry myself to sleep, but to each their own. I would say that in-game economies are at their best when they're able to balance out the risks and rewards of spending in their stores. In these cases, spending money becomes not just a side mechanic, but an integral part to the gameplay and strategy. Oddly enough, I've found The Binding of Isaac to be a great example of this. The game essentially strips down the economy to its core. Money is found randomly from floor to floor, one coin at a time, and the shop is really limited. They sell hearts for three cents, other items like bombs and keys for five cents, but they also sell a randomized pedestal item for 15 cents, which grants you abilities to make you stronger to varying degrees. Every item in the shop has some use, making your shop visits very tricky. Money can also be fairly scarce in the game, and because the floors are randomized, there's always the possibility that the next few floors will be sparse with pennies, meaning that your purchases are always meaningful, and you always need to consider the future before you risk committing to something. You might blow all your money on a 15 cent item, only to find that the shop on the next floor has a way better item and you can't afford it anymore. This is business! This is my sweat! I know, but I did business! Shut up! I've only talked about a handful of titles here but you can already see how the money and gameplay in these games can complement one another to complete a game's package. Like I said before, creating an in-game economy that is effectively intertwined with the gameplay is a difficult task, but developers find great ways to make it work naturally. Now, if you excuse me, I have a Minecraft economy to fix and some kneecaps to break. So thanks for watching.